if you read a lot of papers, um, scientific papers on the subject, you get the impression that the rapid climate change that is evidently starting now is something completely unprecedented. It's not true. Um, those of us who are interested in the past climate changes realize that rapid climate changes have happened before. They're certainly not the same, certainly not with the same cause as what we see now. Um, but they did actually happen. In particular, they happened during and at the end of ice ages. During the last two or three million years, the Earth has actually more often been in an ice age than in the kind of warm period that we're in now. Um, in fact, about 80 or 90 percent of the time um, during that period, the Earth has been in an ice age. But during those ice ages, there were some strange things happened called Dansgaard-Oeschger events or D DO cycles. Um, what happened was at some point, and this happened repeatedly during each ice age, so during the last uh, ice age there were about 20 such events. What happened was a rapid warming followed by a gradual cooling. The rapid warming took place in between about 50 and 200 years. The cooling was more slow than that. And the magnitude of the warming was rather large. Uh, it was spatially variable, um, being largest in the high latitudes. But in Greenland, for example, we know from ice core records that these warmings were of an amplitude up to 16 degrees. Now that's a very big warming um, in lower latitudes. Um, something more like um, five degrees, but nevertheless very substantial um, warming in a rather short period of time. So what's happening today? Simply in terms of the magnitude and speed of the warming um, is not unprecedented. Um, because such things happen repeatedly during the Ice Ages, obviously then the um, living living species must be adapted to some degree um, to deal with rapid warming. Perhaps the most remarkable example are the warmings that happened at the very end of each ice age. So it was like there was a final warming event which turned out to be the big one um, that pushed the Earth system into, into the warm interglacial period, interglacial condition. And we know a great deal in excruciating detail about what happened more or less year by year. Um, 11,700 years ago, which was when the final phase of the last ice age called the Younger Dryas period came to an end. During, during that, that, um, that transition, um, there was a global warming by somewhere between five and seven degrees, and it took place in less than 20 years. Now, again, if you read the literature about present species distribution and climate change, you might get the impression that we were about to suffer mass extinctions of large numbers of species um, on the grounds that they can't keep up with rapid climate change. Well, we do know during that transition period um, at the end of the Ice Age, there certainly were extinctions. They didn't happen Im immediately, but certainly um, in a rather limited period around that time, there were um, large mammals in particular, uh, such as the woolly mammoth, and uh, which was, of course was very abundant um, um, in, the, in the high latitudes um, during the Ice Age, um, became extinct. Uh, the woolly rhinoceros and the giant Irish elk, and so there was a whole long list of of large mammals that went extinct. Now, there's still a raging controversy about the role of um, hunting by uh, p Paleolithic people. Um, to what extent were these animals forced to extinction by overhunting or to what extent by climate change? And I, I despair of this ever being resolved. However, um, I think it's pretty clear that, um, that both were involved. Um, it's hard to imagine this happening without climate change. Um, certainly they may have been given a bit of a push by human activities. 
But we do know, if we go back to earlier ice ages, we find there were also species that went extinct at the end of earlier ice ages as well, even without this kind of help from, um, from people. So climate change had a huge impact on mammals. What about plants? Well, we know quite a lot about the plants because we have a lot of fossil records, um, not only pollen records from all over the world, um, but also uh, plant macrofossils. Um, so we know about um, tens of thousands of species um, that were present in the Ice Age. We know a lot about them. So people are often surprised when I tell them how many species we know about that went extinct, how many plant species that went extinct at the end of the last Ice Age. Well, the total is one. There is a species of spruce called Picea critchfeldii. Um, has been named and properly described as done on the basis of fossil specimens that apparently went extinct. Um, plants apparently were very well able to cope. This has been called the Quaternary Conundrum. The Quaternary is a name for the epoch um, consisting of the last, uh, the last uh, two million years or so. Um, how can it be um, that plants in particular um, were so well able to survive these extraordinary changes in climate that happened um, quite naturally. And it's obviously a question that has considerable contemporary relevance because it suggests that predictions of widespread extinctions of plant species, um, or indeed many other groups that survived very well, um, such as um, most groups of insects, for example, even small mammals, um, did not suffer major extinctions, but the question is how, how is it that they how, how is it that they were they were able to um, able to deal with such rapid climate change, um, and what are the implications for 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 the, the present day? Um, it rather suggests that these dire predictions of mass extinction purely due to climate change can't possibly be correct. In a paper we published in Science a few years back, um, we analysed different types of behaviour that we see in the, um, the paleoecological record. So um, from fossil records we can infer that plants and animals had several different ways of dealing with climate change. There are some species that basically just stayed where they were and just, just put up with it. Um, this is what we call tolerance. Um, we have examples of of, of each of these types of beha behaviour in, in the plant and animal kingdom. So tolerance is a simple, a simple behaviour. Um, we have habitat shifts, so there are known examples where um, the species didn't really move its range very much, but it did move the microhabitat that it occupied. So um, species of plant, for example, that, tended to be, that tend to be found in a certain region on um, north-facing slopes. Now we're found on south-facing slopes, and so just nipped around the other side of the mountain. This is, of course, easier to do in regions of complex topography, um, but that's probably why um, mountain regions tend to be particularly species-rich, species, species rich, is that species have been able to pull this kind of trick um, in the past when faced with, with climate change. So we have uh, toleration, we have habitat shift, we have migration, and there are many, many examples um, where species of both plants and animals have actually moved their range by thousands of kilometres. And so they're evidently capable of doing it, um, even though um, climate has been changing rapidly. It's a bit of a mystery how they manage it. And finally, of course, there is extinction, and there are examples of extinction, but as I said, for plants, we have only one example. Um, for large mammals, we have many others. Now, I just want to say a little about how this issue has been, been treated in recent assessments, because um, I, I think there is a, a major issue that requires, requires resolution. Every six or seven years, um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, puts out um, big reports, huge, thick reports on the state of climate science, and, and each time there are three working groups, each of which produces a thick report. Um, one, working group one, about the physical science basis of climate change. Uh, working group two, 
on impacts, adaptation and vulnerability to climate change and working group three on mitigation, in other words, stopping of climate change. Um, the topic I'm talking about figures in both the physical science basis and the impacts. And it's quite interesting to see how it has been treated. Um, and I should say that these, these reports ought to be authoritative. They are produced um, basically by a very large cross-section of the relevant scientific community. And they are also scrutinized in incredible detail by many, many reviewers, and far more than most of the scientific literature. So you know, thought they ought to get the story right. But there is a bit of a problem here. Um, and, and it, 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 it's, as I mentioned, an issue that, that really rather urgently requires, requires resolution because it has implications for, considerable implications, for example, for conservation policy, which I'll come back to at the end. Um, if you look in the most recent IPCC report series, which, was, which came out in, in 2014, um, you can find all of these in the DO events, um, there's a good, good treatment of them um, in the chapter about past climates. Um, so the details are all there and perfectly correct, as I would expect, considering there were many very good, very good scientists um, pr producing, producing that chapter. But when it comes to the summary, you find some strange things. You find there really isn't much about rapid climate changes. And there, there is a, a figure given for the rate of change at the end of the, uh, the, the last um, last ice age, but the figure is given in degrees per thousand years. So that number is quite small. But I don't see what is the point of talking about degrees per thousand years for a change that happened in 20 years. So I think there's a bit of a problem in the way in which this has been kind of presented sort of like up, up to the top. Um, then in working group two, um, GO events, it turns out, are never, never mentioned. Um, and there is some analysis of the potential vulnerability of different groups, um, different groups of organisms to rapid climate change, which comes to a surprising conclusion. And it's not based on the past data that I've been talking about, but it's based on completely different um, evidence for um, very recent um, um, effects of very recent climate change, which of course have been relatively small, but they are nonetheless detectable. Um, the conclusion is that um, large mammals should be OK. Um, if I slightly oversimplify, uh, large mammals should be OK. Um, small mammals might have a problem. Um, plants that can't move, like trees, should have a big problem. So I don't know what to make of this, because it appears to be directly contradictory um, to, to the paleoecological evidence. Now this really needs sorting out. I would love to sort it out. Um, because it has obvious practical implications. Conservationists have been thrown into um, confusion, I think, by climate change, because um, there is this idea that um, species simply will not be able to keep up um, with the rate of climate change, and in particular, of the velocity of climate change. Velocity is used to refer to the extent to which um, a given climate moves across the landscape. So it's dependent not only on the uh, rate of change in time, but also the gradient in space. And particularly over sort of you know, flat terrain, um, the vo velocity of climate change can, can become extremely high. But nobody's really quantified the past velocity of climate change. And so um, based on, there have been a number of papers based on velocity that basically conclude that most species are, have had it. Um, and from the conservation point of view, you might conclude that in that case, um, the only way, the only thing that we can do um, to preserve species um, is actually to move them, to, to help them to colonize new habitats. Or perhaps it suggests an emphasis simply on conserve, conserving their gene banks, so obviously you know, conserve, you know, simply conserving seeds of plants so that, you know, so that they can in some future time be um, moved to some other Habitat. So this is a kind of a lost ditch rescue operation. Um, our interpretation of the paleo record suggests that actually that would be the wrong place to focus. And um, that instead we should be simply focusing on removing obvious barriers to migration. Now, it's quite true the um, present landscape is a very different landscape from that that existed at the end of the ice age because we've me messed around with this in many ways. Um, we've fragmented it. We've um, 
replaced um, forests with fields and, and so on, so we've made a lot of changes, and so conservation policy might perhaps focus on what is needed to, have to ensure continuity in the landscape, um, rather than sort of mounting some kind of last-ditch operation to avoid extinction.